uh, some of you might have uh, might have seen the the talk on YouTube where we focused on Coke last year, and uh, and so this year we'll try to go uh, further back. Uh, uh, from the because co the Coke investment at Berkshire Hathaway came from uh, some of the lessons they learned from Seas Candy, uh, the purchase of Seas Candy in '72. But we'll go further back uh, uh, from there into uh, the mid the mid to late '60s, and then kind of uh, take it from there. And there are a number of rich lessons uh, in some of the journey uh, that some of these folks took over the over the years. And uh, and I think that there's uh, uh, there's a lot of that can be applied uh, to the likes of uh, yourselves as you embark on your careers and such. Whether or not you become uh, full-time investors, I think it's always good to understand a few things about uh, investing and allocating capital. So uh, I'll go back, uh, you know, into the you know 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, there was a company called. Uh, uh, s and Green Stamps, and uh, most of you probably were not born when the s and Green Stamps were thriving. Uh, maybe even not even your parents were users of them because it was quite a ways back. Uh, but the s and Green Stamps were really the precursor to what uh, today we think of as airline miles. Uh, so it was a kickback mechanism uh, to get loyalty into particular merchants. So for example, if you went to a grocery store and you spent $50, they would give you one of those stamps for every 10 cents that you spent. And then you'd stick these stamps in these books and then uh, you could redeem them at various stamp centers for a variety of uh, uh, things, you know, toasters or, uh, you know, ra tennis rackets or whatever. So there's a wide range of things you could buy. And so, uh, you know, with humans, kickbacks work. And, uh, and they worked in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and it, they work today. I mean, you know, a lot of the, the way I decide which credit cards I use and so on and so forth is determined by the miles and the deals uh, that we get probably similar to uh, most of you. And, um, but, but green stamps had a policy that uh, in a particular geographic area, let's say for example Irvine, if uh, one particular drugstore offered green stamps, they wouldn't allow competing drugstores to offer it. So they kind of created some exclusivity and it also uh, tended to direct business towards the drugstore that carried and offered these stamps. So the have not drugstores, if you will, or the have not grocery stores, um, were not happy about this. And uh, so what they did in response to, because they understood that the, the loyalty programs actually boosted sales, uh, in California, uh, nine different grocers got together and created something called blue chip stamps. And uh, so blue chip stamps basically uh, said, we're going to you know, allow anyone who wants to offer these stamps, offer them, any merchant, we're not going to have these uh, uh, these exclusive type deals, and um, and so these nine uh, these nine uh, grocers basically owned blue chip stamps, and uh, and there were a lot of small merchants who felt like they were kind of shut out of the profit streams that came out of the ownership of blue chip. So they, they felt like you know they hey you know we want to own the mothership. Uh, we don't want to be just be kind of giving you money every time we get a bunch of stamps to give to our customers. So they sued Blue Chip uh, for basically saying this is kind of antitrust and it's kind of collusion and all these things. And in the early 60s, that kind of lawsuit uh, wound its way through the court system. And by 1966, the court agreed uh, with the uh, with the plaintiffs that they were right and that uh, blue chip should be more equitably held uh, by all the merchants who offered it. So what they forced the company to do was offer uh, ownership stake, shares of blue chip stamps to all the merchants who uh, were uh, kind of 
purveyors of these stamps, if you will, and they gave it to them in the proportion of their volume uh, in the last year. So there was a market created uh, for blue chip stamps, and as a result of that market being created, uh, blue chip stamps started trading on uh, the OTC exchange. You know, so you could actually kind of buy and sell shares uh, of blue chip. And um, there's a there's a gentleman Rick Gurren who's uh, was a early partner of Charlie Munger and and uh, and uh, Warren Buffett. He kind of in LA reading the newspapers noticed that all this stuff was happening with blue chip, and uh, he looked at the stock price. And uh, you know, Rick is a very good value investor, and he thought that the uh, the the price that the stock was being offered at was quite compelling, and so he brought it to the attention of uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, and uh, uh, they looked at it as well. But one of the nuances about about blue chip uh, is that uh, every time uh, the merchants gave uh, these stamps to various uh, you know, buyers of groceries or drugs, whatever else, um, a certain percentage never got redeemed. You know, they kind of go to the back of the drawer or people just forget about them and so on and so forth. And so uh, the blue chip business was very much like the insurance business in the sense that uh, with insurance, you collect premium bought dollars today and then the claims come in sometime in the future and sometimes you can be playing claims even 20, 30 years after uh, you've taken the premium in, in. But in the case of blue chip, it was kind of like traveler's checks where people gave you the money today and sometimes those traveler's checks may not be cashed for a year or two years or three years or never, you know, because they just, they get lost, people never claim them and so on and so forth. So blue chip had float, just like insurance companies have float. Uh, but one of the things about float, the blue chip float was, there was a portion of the float that what I would call permanent float. So if you look at the kind of the chart behind me, you see how the revenues of blue chip is going down because it peaked kind of towards the late 60s. And then after that, it kind of started losing its appeal. But you can see the float is multiples of the revenue. And the reason for that is that a certain percentage of the float is permanent in the sense that I don't have the exact numbers, but I would guess something like 5% of the blue chip stamps that were issued never ever came back for redemption. And in fact, my friend Alex is sitting there with a whole bunch of these blue chip stamps that never came back from redemption. And as a gift for you guys coming today, he's gonna give you some stamps so, uh, you know, keep one packet for yourself and then pass it on to your neighbor, if you will. And um, so there's about approximately 50 or 60 million dollars of these stamps, uh, which are now gradually making their way through Etsy and eBay, uh, which never got redeemed. Okay. And so in 67, when Rick Gorin looked at this company, the company had about 50 million in equity. Uh, which was like, you know, uh, the, the book value of the company. Uh, the stock was trading at 40 million. And they had another approximately about 100 million of OPM, other people's money, that they were holding, which was the float of blue chip. And out of that 100 million, my estimate is something like 50 million of that was never going to be redeemed. So that was kind of like found money. So basically, you were able to buy a company with a dollar of assets for 40 cents. It was, it was available very cheap. And so when Rick Gurren brought it to the attention of uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, and they looked at it, they said, yeah, this is great. Uh, but uh, they also noticed that the way the blue chip float and equities were invested was useless. Uh, you know, the people, these grocers who were on the board uh, really didn't have a clue about investing. And so they knew that they had to uh, basically, in effect, take control uh, of the company and then get control of the investing. 
So what they did is from 1967 to 1970, over a three-year period, uh, a number of different entities uh, like the Buffett Partnerships, Warren Buffett personally, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Wheeler Munger Partners, Rick Gorin, and then an entity called Diversified Retailing. All these companies, all these entities together invested about $24 million and they got 60% ownership of Blue Chip and they got control of the company. And first, uh, Charlie Munger went on the board, uh, then Rick Gorin went on the board, and then Warren Buffett. So there were three of them, all three of them on the board. And then they took control of the investment committee and, uh, and sold everything that these guys owned and started to kind of redo uh, everything.